Today we take up chapter one of being in nothingness. I'll be structuring this video through a series of questions, which are as follows. How does the activity of questioning provide insight into the relationship between being for itself and being in itself? Two, what kind of activity is negation? Three, in what ways does Sartre disagree with Hegel and Heidegger's conception of being in nothingness? Four, where does nothingness come from? And five, why are we not in a permanent state of anguish? Sartre explores two distinct forms of existence that were discussed in the intro, being in itself and being for itself. He considers the connection between these two existential elements. To ground this relation, he reframes it as one of being between humans and the world, or being in the world, which gives rise to then two questions. First, how do we define our relationship of being in the world? And secondly, what inherent characteristics must both humans and the world possess to enable this relation? Sartre addresses these inquiries by focusing on a unique aspect of human behavior. He believes that this focus will offer a more thorough understanding of the entire spectrum of this relation. Given that the nature of this exploration is built around an inquiry, it seems fitting then to begin with this fundamental mode of conduct, the activity of questioning. So what is a question? Sartre initially characterizes it as a human attitude filled with meaning. But what does the act of questioning involve? It commences with a being that poses questions and another that is the subject of those questions. This questioning necessitates a leap from the questioner toward the being being questioned. It also implies an anticipation of an answer in which the question being unveils some aspects of its existence. Yet the act also inherently acknowledges the potential non-being of that which is questioned. So let's take a common scenario. I often find myself wondering, where have I left my keys? I probe the whereabouts of the keys and then begin to search for them in the usual places. Regrettably, more times than I'd care to admit, I'm faced with the stark absence of my keys. They are seemingly nowhere. In this process, I don't just concede the key's non-being, but I also grasp the non-being of my knowledge. I don't know where they are. Moreover, this non-being is the foundation for any potential positive response I might receive. In other words, if I happen to find my keys, their existence becomes apparent to me from the previously acknowledged possibility of their non-being along with the non-being of my knowledge. Sartre's investigation into the act of questioning as a fundamental human activity, which sheds light on our connection to the world, is not limited to a relation of being for itself with being in itself. It also encompasses the relationship between being and non-being, as well as our understanding of our own non-being and its relationship to a transcendent being, the keys in the example I used. Now you might be wondering, what is the big deal? When I say my keys are not on the table, why should we attribute any importance to this state of non-being beyond the fact that I'm using a common grammatical form of the word not. Isn't this just me passing a judgment where I'm simply denying a characteristic or a condition? X is not present. In this scenario, negation might seem as nothing more than a straightforward mental exercise performed on an existing object. It doesn't necessarily suggest that we should attribute an independence to nothingness itself. Sartre, however, sees things differently. He asserts that negation is not just a form of judgment. Rather, it's a prejudicative attitude that can occasionally be expressed as a judgment in response to a query. The very act of posing a question involves my relationship with a being that encompasses an intuitive grasp of non-being as a viable possibility. Therefore, there exists a connection between being and non-being within the overall relation between beings. 
Now, thankfully, Sartre offers an example of a non-judicative act that illustrates our intuitive, immediate comprehension of non-being, which he's suggesting we have, that being the concepts of destruction and fragility. Sartre maintains that destruction is purely a human feat. This may sound odd to us. After all, don't we talk about natural disasters? However, nature doesn't destroy, Sartre says. It merely modifies. The concept of destruction implies a value, and these values are derived from us. And so destruction signifies our relationship with other beings, a bond of transcendence. And it's within the confines of this relationship that we can perceive a being's susceptibility to destruction. Fragility is the apprehension of this possibility of destruction, a probability of non-being for a particular being under specific circumstances. Faced with this possibility of non-being of something, we shape our responses. We could act to confirm this fragility by bringing about actual destruction. Alternatively, we could uphold destruction as merely a possibility by implementing some kind of preventative measures from the being being destroyed. Hence, destruction assumes a prejudicative understanding of nothingness, which influences our actions toward it. Fragility and destruction aren't just subjective perceptions. They are objective realities imposed on us by the beings themselves. The vase doesn't become fragile because of my perception. Its fragility is intrinsic to my understanding of the vase as a vase. And as a result, I can't consider the vase without tacitly acknowledging the presence of nothingness. That's why Sartre proposes that non-being possesses a trans-phenomenality, just as being does and which we've discussed in the introduction. Sartre shares another example to demonstrate the trans-phenomenality of non-being. In this scenario, I'm supposed to meet Pierre at a cafe. Running 15 minutes late, I finally arrive, only to find that he's not there. But how do I arrive at that conclusion? Sartre starts by explaining the nature of perception. And it's a manner of explaining things that is reminiscent of what we'll later see done by Maurice merleau ponty In perception, we always recognize a figure set against a backdrop. The identity of this figure and its contrasting backgrounds depends on where my attention is directed. When I'm looking for Pierre, the entire cafe scene turns into the backdrop. This necessitates the nullification or nihilation of all other figures in the scene, which get absorbed into the sheer neutrality of the background. It's this absence of the background that summons the emergence of a particular figure. However, in this case, what arises to the forefront is the absence of Pierre. And so here, my intuitive understanding of a double nihilation, the non-being of the background and the non-being of Pierre, forms the conditions necessary for me to conclude and make the judgment that Pierre is not here. Sartre sums up all of these insights by asserting that non-being isn't just a matter of judgment. Rather, it's the judgment itself that's underpinned by non-being. To express not relies on the perpetual presence of non-being within us and around us, persisting always and everywhere, leading Sartre to assert nothingness haunts being. Then Sartre poses a question. If non-being is the foundation for all questions, and even for all philosophical investigation, where does it originate? And what is our fundamental connection to this nothingness? In the third and fourth sections of the first chapter, Sartre strives to begin uncovering the origins of nothingness, exploring it first as a dialectical concept and then as a phenomenological one. The dialectical concept of nothingness will naturally reference Hegel's work, it is essential to keep in mind here that we're summarizing Sartre's interpretation of Hegel, an interpretation that is likely to spur disagreements. Sartre explains that Hegel views the relationship between being and non-being as complementary elements akin to lightness and darkness that form a concrete unity. But what does this concrete unity signify? 
It embodies a being expressing its essence. A being without essence is a mere hollow immediacy, while essence is mediated through being. And the essence forms the basis and the origin of being. Their unity embodies the true concrete. Since a being is only authentically itself when it reveals its essence, pure being, that is, being devoid of essence, is equivalent to non-being or pure nothingness. Sartre, in contrast, claims that being does not manifest an essence, but is the ground through which a phenomenon manifests its characteristics. Sartre also disputes Hegel's view of being and nothingness as opposing forces and hence simultaneous entities. Instead, he views their relationship as contradictory, an intriguing stance considering later interpretations depicting Hegel as a philosopher of contradiction rather than of synthesis. By contradiction, Sartre suggests that nothingness logically follows from being. They do not exist on the same plane, nor does nothingness constitute an original chasm from which being arises, like the ex nihilo concept of Christian theology. Instead, nothingness presupposes being. Indeed, nothingness possesses a kind of parasitic quality, having a borrowed existence, since its efficacy is derived solely from being itself. As for the phenomenological concept of nothingness, Sartre turns to Heidegger, with whom he appears to have greater alignment. Sartre leans towards Heidegger's theory of nothingness over Hegel's as he doesn't depict being in nothingness as hollow abstractions. In Heidegger's view, being has a tangible meaning and pre-ontological understanding that manifests in our everyday life. Nothingness, in turn, expresses itself through certain moods that hint at an unspoken understanding of it as well. Another crucial aspect of Heidegger's concept of nothingness is its relationship to transcendence. According to Heidegger, being only achieves its true nature by exceeding or transcending being itself. More precisely, Dasein, or the being that we are, moves beyond what is actual to the pure possibility of being, from which actual being takes root. This implies that being becomes itself through what it is not. Furthermore, the process occurs solely through Dasein who surpasses itself toward its utmost possibilities. Dasein is a being of distances, finding itself within its own nothingness and actualizing possibilities in the world only through a profound sense of the world's radical contingency encountered in the mode of the uncanny. The mood of anguish, sometimes translated as anxiety or left untranslated as angst, represents the discovery of this double continual nihilation, the nothingness from which human reality arises and the nothingness within which the world is situated. Hence, nothingness engulfs being from every angle. Sartre then prompts us to ponder, do these interpretations of being in nothingness by Heidegger suffice? Is it accurate to propose that being springs from nothingness, that nothingness cradles being within its depths as opposed to being embracing nothingness within itself? Furthermore, is it right to position nothingness completely outside of the world as the foundation for being? Sartre detects some missed opportunities in Heidegger. When Heidegger portrays Dasein as perpetually outside of itself, as in the world, as a being of distances, as care, and so on, he overlooks that these all ultimately suggest that Dasein is not in itself. Moreover, Heidegger casts nothingness as the intentional correlate of transcendence, but fails to realize that he has already embedded nothingness into the very structure of transcendence. He fails to see how already being must inherently encompass non-being for it to be at all. To elucidate this point, and since we've already talked about Dasein as a being of distances, Sartre addresses the notion of distance, initially in a literal sense as the measurable straight line established between two points. For the line to be itself, it doesn't need to transcend its own limits to exceed itself. Instead, its positive attribute of length is enabled by the negation of an absolute uniform proximity 
that's always intrinsically there. Therefore, as Sartre notes, negation is the cement which realizes this unity. It is an intrinsic reality and inner logic of length, even if it's concealed by reducing distance to the positivity of straightforward measurement. This example ushers us into the realm of a new classification of realities, which the English text leaves untranslated as negatite. The defining characteristic of those phenomena is that negation is intrinsically woven into their very being. It's not merely an additive element, but an integral part of their makeup. I've labeled them realities as opposed to beings because they do not align fully with the standard conception of being in its pure positivity. Instead, they are scattered within and propped up by being and serve as the foundational conditions that allow beings to be perceived and understood. To summarize a little bit of what we've done so far, at the beginning of chapter one, we began with a question concerning the relation of our being with other beings. This led to an examination of the act of questioning as a type of human conduct that might shed light on this relation. Questioning requires there be some kind of negation, and the foundation of such negation is not some mental act of judgment, but in nothingness itself. Nothingness is not simultaneous with being, nor is it outside or prior to being. Instead, to quote Sartre, nothingness lies coiled in the heart of being, like a worm. And it's from this nothingness that our recognition of negatite arises. Despite these developments, the original question regarding the source of nothingness remains unanswered. In our explorations of questioning, the concepts of destruction and fragility and the absence of Pierre in the cafe, we realize that this nothingness is not something that resides within being in itself. As previously stated, nature doesn't destroy. It's we humans who interact with being in itself in such a way that we can comprehend destruction. This provides the critical clue for pinpointing the genesis of nothingness. Nothingness is exclusive to a being through whom nothingness can infiltrate other beings. Nothingness reaches those beings only through the being for whom the nothingness of its being is at stake. As Sartre writes, the being by which nothingness comes to the world must be its own nothingness. Thus, nothingness intrinsically belongs to human beings. To be human is to be the conduit through which nothingness permeates the world. Negatete then delineates the relationship between human reality and the world and establishes a crucial condition for things in that world to serve any function and to be apprehended. But this leads to a fresh question. If nothingness inherently belongs to the human being, then what kind of being must we be for nothingness to permeate the world through us? Sartre's response is freedom, which he defines as the being of consciousness. And this consciousness exists both as a consciousness of freedom and a consciousness that stems from freedom. So we're both aware of ourselves as free and our awareness itself is the expression of freedom. But more specifically, how do we experience the consciousness of freedom and how is it typically expressed? We perceive it as anguish, Sartre says, which is manifested through time, through temporality. Sartre offers several examples to illustrate this point. First, let's consider standing on a precipice. Faced with the daunting height, we might feel fear or anguish. But what distinguishes these two? When we fear heights, we see ourselves as fragile, destructible objects, not responsible for our own potential downfall. We fear that we could die. But how does then anguish differ from this? When confronted with a height, the anguish we feel isn't simply about the potential danger of a fatal fall, which would be fear, but instead the anguish arises from the possibility that we could voluntarily leap from the edge. The horrifying reality is that nothing compels us to ensure our own safety, nor prevents us from jumping off. To evade this anguish, we may convince ourselves that our actions are determined. 
we reassure ourselves that we never jump because our instinct for self-preservation is too strong, that our values and past experiences have conditioned us to exclude such a horrifying possibility. In essence, we perceive ourselves through a lens of psychological determinism. Consequently, to dodge anguish then requires us to renounce our freedom. This example illustrates what Sartre calls an anguish in the future. There is a relation between my present being and my future being. Anguish enters in due to the nothingness that slips into the heart of this relation and wherein I discover a distance between who I am and who I will be. I am not the self I will be and for at least three reasons. First, because time itself separates present and future, but also, second, I am not the foundation of what I will be. I cannot cause who I will be. And third, nothing actual in my present, internally or externally, strictly determines what I will be. And at the same time, and somewhat paradoxically, I am already what I will be as well, because my future self will be in the mode of not being its future self, just as I am in the mode of not being my future self. In other words, my present being identifies with my future being in their shared nothingness. Furthermore, anguish is my consciousness of being my own future in the mode of not being it. The anguish I now encounter will only be dealt with or decided upon by this future self that I am not yet, Sartre says. The self which I am depends on the self which I am not yet, to the exact extent that the self which I am not yet does not depend on the self which I am. Another example illustrating the temporality of anguish is a gambler. Let's say I'm a gambler and I've decided not to gamble anymore, but only to see my resolution melt away. I experience anguish over the ineffectiveness of my past resolution. I continue to be this past self who made this resolution to the degree I identify with myself through the flow of time, yet this past self is a mere object for my consciousness and not something that I am strictly determined by. Just as there is a separation between present and future, now we can see that there's also a separation between present and past. Here we have what's called the anguish of the past. As I apprehend the void between this past self who made a resolution and my present being faced with an undetermined choice to adhere to that past or not. Now as a little caveat here, but one that's interesting enough to mention, Sartre draws a link between anguish and freedom but he isn't providing a logical proof for freedom as one would expect in the traditional debates between freedom and determinism. His intent is solely to demonstrate that there exists a distinct consciousness of freedom, which is encountered as anguish. And this is really a phenomenological point. Anguish, he argues, is a fundamental structure of the consciousness of freedom regardless of the reality of that freedom. Any supposed evidence of psychological determinism does not invalidate Sartre's analysis, he feels. Even if it turned out that this anguish is merely the byproduct of an ignorance about what actually determines us, that would not mean that anguish is invalid. It would still be the apprehension of freedom. Nothingness is this consciousness of freedom, a consciousness that manifests as anguish and establishes a divide between the past and the present and the present and the future, as well as between motivations and actions. Motives are never an intrinsic part of consciousness, but rather they exist for consciousness. This implies that consciousness is not constrained by them, but rather consciousness posits these motives and determines their significance and relevance. Consciousness itself is its acts wherein we surpass ourselves in directing ourselves toward another being, a being in itself. Such acts always go beyond any kind of essence of the self as well.
These essences are not some immutable truth. Instead, our essences are merely the totality of what we've been and what we are, the totality of characteristics which we use to explain our actions. Another way of putting it, it is the being for itself looking at itself as a being in itself. But as consciousness, we are constantly overflowing our essence and reshaping it to be something other than what it is. This leads to a final question for chapter one. If freedom is a fundamental element of consciousness, and if anguish is the manifestation of this freedom, why are we not in a permanent state of anguish? Why is the phenomenon of anguish exceptional? His answer is that most situations in our day-to-day -day lives do not manifest anguish because the very structure of those situations excludes it. What does this mean? I think it's helpful to keep in mind Heidegger's notions of everydayness and das Mann, sometimes translated as the they. According to Heidegger, our daily relationship with our surrounding environment is based in habitual ways of being that have been shaped by what others say and do. In filming this video right now, I come to the situation with some preloaded expectations about what I'm supposed to do, that I should be positioned somewhere toward the middle of the screen, that I should say things in a certain way that others will understand, that the microphone should be positioned in a way to pick up my voice clearly, etc. Yes, all of these elements present choices that I am free to make or not make, but in fact, I don't have to put much thought into them. They are, as Sartre says, instantly realizable possibilities, and wherein I am often in a fairly non-reflective mode of consciousness. Sartre provides the example of writing a sentence, wherein there is a whole set of passive exigencies that appear to me as a complex of instruments. The pen, ink, paper, lines, margins, etc. And we use all these instruments and things in our environment in a rather intuitive, non-thinking manner. We often act before positing our possibilities as possibilities. Another example Sartre provides is the alarm going off. The ringing alarm refers to my possibility of going to work or school, and to answer its call means that I get up. However, I don't have a sense of anguish over this possibility since I defer this responsibility to the alarm that tells me my possibilities without my reflectively realizing that it is I who confer upon the alarm clock its meaning. This is what Sartre calls the world of the immediate, wherein we discover ourselves in a world peopled with demands and while being in the midst of realizing various projects in our lives. While perfectly ordinary and expected, these situations do shield us from anguish, and the totality of manners by which we hide ourselves Sartre identifies as a flight from anguish. And there are several ways this flight is enacted. First, as I've already mentioned, there is psychological determinism. What Sartre means here is not primarily the theoretical concept itself, but how it's concretely expressed as an attitude of excuse, and in fact the basis of all attitudes of excuse. Psychological determinism happens every time we explain our behavior based on our past and present, including external and internal causes or factors. It is the assigning of a foundation for our actions external to the acts themselves. Such an attitude denies transcendence and reduces us to never being anything but what we are. Second, there is distraction. Distraction entails a more reflective level of consciousness as I apprehend my possibilities as properly belonging to me, but these Possibilities are embraced only insofar as I deny other possibilities that are hostile to those possibilities that I have embraced. Now reading this, I thought about the messages delivered by certain self-help gurus who motivate you to assume certain possibilities, making money, achieving your dream life, getting your dream job or relationship. And a common component in these messages is that you have to also not allow doubt to creep in, that you must foreclose from your mind the possibility of not achieving those outcomes. As one famous self-help guru said, you should turn your shoulds into musts. 
Otherwise, you should all over yourself. I'm also reminded of what Heidegger says about Dasein inauthentically relating to death. Rather than radically come to terms with death as my own most possibility, I only apprehend death as a logical possibility rather than an existential one. Thus, we say people die or one dies rather than really confronting the fact that it is me who dies. This distracted flight from anguish Sartre also calls the freedom of the other. It means that we're avoiding considering other possibilities by making them the possibilities of some undifferentiated other. In particular, we turn ourselves into another being a being in itself and confer it the freedom for those possibilities without truly claiming them as my own. As Sartre states, we apprehend our freedom in a self in the same way as a father recognizes himself and finds himself in his son who continues his work. In this way, we tone down all the original nihilation in other possibilities by describing them as if it were another person. And at the same time, we're always ready to take refuge in psychological determinism if this freedom we conferred upon the other begins to impinge upon us as anguish. And yet there's another kind of paradox here, as the only way I can flee from anguish in these manners is by being acquainted with anguish, to be aware of those aspects that I wish not to see. I flee so as to not know but cannot avoid knowing what I am fleeing from. For this reason, anguish and the flight from anguish are given in the unity of the same consciousness. And thus, the flight from anguish is a mode of becoming conscious of anguish. And the attitude of bad faith is this consciousness of anguish that's in the mode of not being anguished. And it will be this notion of bad faith that will be the focus of chapter two. Along with liking, sharing, and subscribing, you can support this work using the super thanks button below this video. To be an ongoing supporter of this channel, I have a Patreon page where I offer video transcripts, unedited materials, and prioritize questions and comments. The link is below. I want to thank the following for already supporting this channel on Patreon. As always, thank you for watching, and until next time, be well or don't be well, or whatever. Just don't think that whether you're well or not, it's because of something other than your choice to be well or not well.